of whether Wisconsin would count all the votes, whether people would have access uh, to abortion. All these things were in play in Wisconsin Senate race, or a Supreme Court race. And, and Gen Z came out. They came out. They're engaged. They're highly motivated. And they're starting to change the whole demographic of voting. And I can't wait for more of that. <laughs> so that is a, 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 an ongoing feature. Let's see. Now, this is another feature of Gen Z. Actually, there's, this is from 21, but 23 is hit 50 percent. About but here, it's almost 50 percent of Gen Z when asked, "What is your religion? Uh, are you Buddhist? Are you Christian? Are you Jewish? Muslim?" They'll say, "None of the above. Don't fit any category. Maybe I fit multiple categories. I'm still trying to figure it out." Um, that's a significant shift. Um, it it kind of mirrors the millennials. But as you notice, as you get older generations, um, the religious people are more connected to institutions and religious identities. So this is kind of useful when I think about campus ministry and MSU billing, because Montana has a greater percentage of nuns than most states. Where actually our religiosity mirrors more like Washington and Oregon and, uh, than it does like the Dakotas. Um, and I have second generation nuns, that is. I always feel weird saying that because I think of the flying ones. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 these are, these are, not, <laughs> these are um, um, folks who they never really went to church growing up, and then their parents didn't really go to church because their parents are my generation, and Gen X didn't really go to church either. And um, um, the, the positive is, you know, when I was in the deep, we were in Oklahoma. And there are so many people wounded by Christianity, especially LGBT folks. I don't run into that a lot with my MSUB students. It's because they don't have any, you know, they never went to church. They never had any kind of engagement with that. Um, I mean, they see stuff in the news, and that's terrifying enough. But um, in some ways, it's easier to have faith conversations at MSUB than when we were in Oklahoma, because some of that trauma just isn't there. So that's the good part. But the bad part is I, remember I hit an LGBT in the Bible presentation a couple of years ago. And you know, one of the famous stories that is referenced for same-sex love is the love that Jonathan has for King David. Um, Jonathan being Saul's son. And um, my, all my students just looked at me like, who's King David? <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> yeah, so, so, so yeah. Um, which is why we need religious studies to be invested in at our universities. But, so let's see what else we got here. Um, now this is interesting, I want to mention a couple things. Uh, um, uh, so, the last two stats I'm more interested in. When you look at um, Gen Z political priorities, they're, they're actually kind of normal and saying they're worried about student loans and debt and whether they can get a house or a job, or a career, and, um, and another stat is the majority of Gen Z do not believe they will be better off than their parents in terms of their finances. I think millennials might have similar stats. Um, now, the Montana House and Senate just passed legislation to ban the use of TikTok. 20% of all Gen Zers get information on issues and politics on TikTok. And especially LGBT uh, Gen Z, and I don't think that was a mis I don't think that's an accident that the Montana legislature is going after that. Okay, uh, now I won't be able to read it. But the, but basically, social media is becoming very significant uh, sources of information. Um, and the one that surprised me working in campus ministry was like YouTube, <laughs> um, which is there's some amazing resources. But just like the national news. And in fact, I don't think any less accurate than what you would get if you were to turn on cable, right? But there's also obviously several false stuff on there too. So discernment about social media becomes the key. Um, but interestingly enough, I don't know if I, I, if I have a survey or not, Gen Z actually is both skeptical. They rely on social media, but they're also skeptical. And they add, those attitudes are kind of how it's put together. Um, let's see. Um, but where you get your sources of information, unfortunately, I'm going to like literally look up into the computer screen. Uh, <clears throat> this is where you start seeing generational divides. Millennials still use Facebook, and when I talk to my college students, they're like, you know, I 
joke against Facebook. <laughs> um, um, and so I'm Gen X going, hey, let's connect on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Zero percent on LinkedIn. You guys don't have a LinkedIn account? No. Okay. Only <laughs> you'll still use LinkedIn. So, um, social media is the top. Uh, whereas most Americans say newspapers. But I don't know anybody can afford the Billings Gazette anymore. <laughs> Podcasts as a source of information. Um, but yeah, let's, we'll change slides there. Obviously, when it comes to social issues, the, 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 the partisan breakdown I showed uh, that's playing itself out in the midterms of the 2020 election, and will continue to do so, is that Gen Z actually do share this with millennials. Their, their, um, uh, their values very much overlap in terms of LGBT inclusion, um, in terms of concern about climate change, which re re registers very significantly. Um, and should the government do things to kind of address problems? You know, there's poverty, there's low wages, there's gun violence. What should we do? Uh, Gen Z and, uh, is the highest percentage of folks saying, well, the government should do something about this. You know, we should actually pass laws and address these kind of issues. Um, notice that that declines uh, as, as, you, as it gets older there. Um, as, much, as scary as it is, especially for LGBT uh, students seeing what's happening in the national discourse, you are kind of going, well, you know, if there's just some more generational replacement. In other words, um, as more Gen Z more go, moves into, uh, and millennials both, uh, make up a more significant portion of the electorate. That, I think, might change our national discourse. I'll just say this, all my students, well, not, I have a stat somewhere, it's 91% of MSUB students are from Billings or Eastern Montana, right? And so I, I've had, you know, students from, I don't want to say Baker, <laughs> to say Baker, uh, uh, Miles City, Colstrip, Sydney, Bainville, Glendive, uh, many of them grew up in pretty conservative homes. Um, LGBT inclusion is just like a given. It doesn't matter, I mean, it's not partisan, right? It's just, what it means to be a, a human being. <laughs> and I, so I've never run into that. I, I, I teach philosophy. I never feel like I can't disclose who I am and not be fully accepted by students there. So the culture war you're seeing on national TV, I don't see that happening at MSUB. Let's see what, the next slide. Oh, this is because the right wing kind of got upset with this, so I want to kind of clarify. About 20% of Gen Z identify as LGBT. And a lot of folks hear that and go, what, 20% of Gen Z are gay and lesbians? No, <laughs> right? The, their percentage is 4%, right? You know, it's percentage of folks who don't identify with heterosexual kind of normative accounts of gender and sexuality. When you start adding in asexual, pansexual, bi, you know, it's, a, it's a much more significant field. There's just more language, and we were talking, Chuck and I were talking about that at some point if you guys wanted, I did talk to uh, Charlene Sinker about wanting to do a presentation on gender and gender fluidity and some of that conversation. But Gen Z is already there. Um, um, let's move to, this is millennials. I couldn't find this for Gen Z. But I just want to note that 27% of millennials, this is a stat from 21, own their own home much lower percentage than Gen X at the same time, at the same age they were at, or baby boomers. I don't want to be pessimistic for Gen Z, but home ownership is a significant source of wealth that, young, uh, that consistently and across countries, young people are being cut off from. And so all the kind of things are marketed to say, well, you're a responsible adult now. We have to listen to what you say. Are you married? Do you have a career? a house. All these, so many of these things are being cut off from younger generations, so there's no kind of external things to say, hey, we now recognize you. Uh, let's move to the next. Uh, Gen Z always, I, I do think though, uh, there's a couple of mental health stats. Uh, Gen Z ranks, it always ranks the worst for mental health, but I actually think these, this is positive. The, in other words, 
do, do, did I need a counselor? Do I, am I suffering mental stress? Do I feel anxious? Gen Z consistently ranks the highest. But my theory about that is, some articles I read, and certainly talking to students, it's not that they actually are more stressed, it's that they're more, they have the language to identify. This is what I'm feeling, and this is the resources I need to go to to kind of address that. And older generations still are, you know, buck it up, <laughs> right? Um, even like being Gen X, I've, I've heard buck it up a few times, right? I don't have any problems. Let me stew in my own anxiety alone. Um, so so um, I think it's an expression of the health of Gen Z. But obviously, if they're identifying issues of concern about social isolation or economic anxiety, and existential anxiety about things like our climate change isn't addressed, they get to live in a world that's gonna be a heck of a lot hotter, you know, and all the ramifications. So let's move to the next slide. Oh, student loan debt. <laughs> the average student loan debt, 36,000. Um, wanna help Gen Z? Well, actually millennials, some Gen Xers, and there's probably some boomers out there with student loan debt. You know, this is a significant issue. And it, it literally locks you from so many of participating economically in society. And, um, and MSUB students are, have a higher percentage of students who are first generation, um, and they're therefore likely to take out more loans, um, may not have family support to go to school. Um, and so the economic anxiety is always a, a part of the equation. Okay. Um, 68% of Gen Z feels stressed about the nation's future. 66 don't believe the country is improving. Um, this is an older slide. Um, but it, there is an existential kind of depression. I don't know if you've ever felt it, but if you've ever read about anything, about what's happening in the state legislature or national politics, or the way that people talk to each other and about each other, it can be very, you know, it's possible to go down a spiral. I, I recognize that. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh, so MSUB is a, let me talk about MSUB. I, I don't, let's see, I, I'm trying to look at the clock, but and to things that make MSUB distinct. On one hand, we're pretty doggone affordable as a college, um, but still it's no small feat to be paying $6,000 a year for tuition, which is what students are, uh, are, are, are paying. Um, and uh, even though you can see what the average is closer to 20,000 a, a, a year. So uh, let's see well, what else we got here. I'll do, uh, there you go, 92.5% of MHUE students are from Montana and often from this area, Yellowstone County um, and, and Eastern Montana. And now I'm getting old enough that I'm like, oh wait, I know your dad. <laughs> I have those conversations. I went to school with them. Um, this is not unusual. Uh, you can see the age um, diversity, you know, and, and I think the average age is like 24 for an MSUB student. Um, but you can see literally all ages are represented in the classroom. Um, and this is for just for undergrad programs. Okay, let's see what else we got. Um, just more breakdown. Here it is 25, 25.1. So this is not like all 18 year olds run, rushing off to go to school. This is folks from all backgrounds and ages uh, taking classes. About half of them being full-time and half being uh, not full-time. And it includes city college students. Uh, we're pretty white campus. Uh, that is not Gen Z, that's not representative of Gen Z. Um, though we have a significant native student population. That is noticeable itself on the campus. Okay. Um, oh yeah. So there's Gen Z's. 82% uh, of, of early boomers uh, are white, compared to 52% of Gen Z. So we're, it's a much more racially diverse. Now, like I said, MSU Billings doesn't fit that because we're Eastern Montana College, right? Um, let me let's see what else we got here before I go to. And it bears on the social political because that's so much divided by race. Let's see what we got. Okay, before I go, okay, go ahead and stuff. 
So if it should be, this is, I'll see if, I'll see if uh, listen to kids agree. Um, I mentioned some of the social political. The impression I have of MSUB students, okay, well, first of all, as I mentioned, they tend to be local. Um, they have a higher percentage of folks who are first generation. Um, they often know each other because they come from the same communities. Um, so those relationships are built kind of early on. It's very easy to get community at MSUB on one level because, like, I don't even have to know a student's name, I'll just run into them. There's only like one dining hall. If you're a freshman or under, you have to take classes in the LA building. Um, there's two dorms. Um, so we keep on running into each other. Um, uh, oh, we'll go back further, back to the previous slide, yeah. Uh, these, uh, um, after telling this great news about how awesome and progressive Gen Z is, I don't know if I would say speak about that at MSUB because most of them grew up in eastern Montana. If you know some of the counties in Richland County, 80%, 75% of Richland County voted for Trump, but 80% of Dawson County. But I've never met a student who was impressed with Donald Trump. So what I run into at MSUB is not hotbeds of progressive activism. Because sometimes people will call me as a chapter cast of Spencer, like, we want to organize college students to do a protest. And I'm like, no, that's not how, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that's not how that works here. I mean, and I went, you know, Missoula and Bozeman, more significant. And that also speaks to their, their socioeconomic. Uh, but the nice thing is the flip side. So the socioeconomic backgrounds of folks who are pretty on the left tend to also be pretty middle class, but it also is for the folks on the right. Um, so when I, I talked to Kim about Rocky, she has all these kind of, kind of right-wing students organized, and, and she's surprised to discover that MSUB is like, no, we don't have any. Come on, you guys, don't organize. <laughs> you know, um, so that makes so 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 the culture war is not near as significant. Um, and when I run into students who only grew up with families who are like Trump, 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 they, they weren't impressed. Their solution is not to become Democrats. Their solution is to go, I'm, I'm not sure I trust politicians. I'm not sure I trust either party. I'm suspicious, right? So there's kind of a disengagement from the political process that I run into at MSU. Uh, because they kind of got burnt once, so they're not sure to give it to somebody else. And that attitude about politics, Kevin Spencer, religion, or any number of forms of you know identity. So um, um, but so it's nice though, because the culture of war, the divides, like, uh, the, you know, I had somebody like, well, you're so liberal, you'd never have a, I couldn't imagine you having students who are like own guns. I'm like, of course I do. Never reach about that, of course I have people who own guns. This is just, you know, uh, or hunt or do, in, in other words, the, the nice clean divides we're used to on national TV, I don't see the imagery, you know. Um, and that's really nice, it's like a lower temperature. <laughs> when you're on the campus. Um, um, actually, I'll skip this slide. Uh, um, so, 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 we, I, I'm sorry, you guys are in a lot of photos. Just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> They're used to this at this point. But basically, so we do faith programming, but again, I, I'd say half my students don't connect to any particular religious tradition. They want to be in a community. They want to, they, they, there's a kind of social element. Uh, or you, you move to campus and you live in the dorms, where are you gonna go? And we do have two uh, confessional, I call them evangelical campus ministries, but you kind of have to know, this is what I believe and I've got all of this lined up. And for anybody who doesn't, there, there's us. <laughs> you don't have to have it lined up, right? Um, in fact, you can't read it. This is, uh, Charlie had written, it's a Bible, it's fan fiction. <laughs> she was doing a little art picture on my on the posters we had up there. So um, let's continue to. Uh, so we uh, UCM sponsors out at MSU Billings, the LGBT group, and uh, often folks come out of the closet in college. You know, you always hear articles. Oh, they're coming out in junior high. They're coming out in high school. It's not always possible to do that in Shepherd or in you know like you know in Ashland or, um, but they can in college. So this is the first real opportunity. Um, and they are their own registered student group, but the UCM started it in 2014. Though I've heard stories that out has, uh, there's been LGBT group organized on some level throughout the years. But th this is to provide institutional support. Okay, 
Let's see what else we got here. I want to do a road trip. Anyways, we went out. We, we, we were talking about that. We'll skip that. Um, this is what we're known for on campus, is autism room. Um, now, this is interesting, and I, I present this for uh, you, for the EUs in particular. Uh, autistic folks, when they've done studies on religion, have discovered that, well, the majority of autistic folks are atheist or agnostic. Um, that's Whereas among the American population as a whole, it's more like 4.5%, right? I think if you add agnostic, maybe 10. Um, the second largest group are folks who are like, I'm trying to put it together myself, right? I can't just accept something that's told to me. I need to figure it out and I'll piece from here and here. That's a significant group of folks who could so fit into a UU concept. Right? There's, there's a, I'm trying to figure it out, and I don't want somebody to tell me, but I'm willing to be with people who are also trying to do the same thing. Um, so, uh, um, and this just kind of started as a, well, it's just a social group, really. It's Friday night kind of social hangout games, yes. So you started this club? Or yeah, so what happened was uh, we literally had a student, this is how I mentioned the chaplaincy slide. I had this, Disability services called me. There's this student. He says he doesn't have any friends, which is terrible, right? To go to college and not have friends. Speaking about college retention, if you don't know anybody on the campus, the chances you're going to come back for the next semester is pretty limited. And uh, him and I got it's Liam. <laughs> him and I got together, and we were just like, "Hey, well, let's do this." And then it's especially in the last three years, it's kind of just exploded. It may be one of the biggest social gatherings on campus. Here's a. I'll do another. A slide here. Ta da! Yeah, we just take over the Missouri. <laughs> Pizza and card games and, um, and movies and discussions and puppet history, which, if you have, well, which is wonderful, just look it up on YouTube. Uh, movie nights. Oh, yeah, there's a film, the film club. Um, whenever students have an interest, we just kind of build a group out of it. That's basically how it works. So, I mean, it's one of those things, again, if you're at another university, you know, I was talking to the campus minister in Bozeman, he goes, we're one of 150 groups. How in the heck do you stand out? MSU doesn't have 150 groups, right? Um, they don't tend to get organized in groups, or they may be reliant on a student who is very involved, and they graduate, and the group falls apart. So, UCM has kind of just started acting as the, oh, students have an idea, Let's create a group out of it. So this the next group kind of happened that way. We'll do another slide. Dungeons and Dragons. The gaming club used to do D and D, and then and then we had the um, uh, COVID, and all the groups, almost of the, most of the student groups died. They didn't have staff back, so no more D and D. And this is a, the students like doing D and D. And just as a side note, people have a vision of Gen Z and screens. So we had a game night one time where we were like. You know, like 40 plus students. And we had, you know, the computer game set up, the board game set up, the card game set up, and everybody's like, well, we just want to do cards. You know, screens are not, our Gen Z is so addicted to their screens. It's like, no, they're, they may be more realistic about screen time than, than, than most folks, but when given an option, they, they you know, Dungeons and Dragons, this is paper and pencil, <laughs> right? And just using your imagination. Yeah. Um, this is where often they opt for, you know? So let's see, what else we got here? Oh, this is just a sell effect. We brought an autistic comedian on campus, Michael McCreary. We're thinking about doing it again, maybe. So if we do, I'll let Jim know, it, you know, you're invited. He uses comedy to kind of share about being on the spectrum. And he's a huge film buff, so he connected with our autism group really uh, significantly. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Uh, so I, I've looked through the I've looked through UCM. UCM has been around since 1967, and I, ironically enough, we're not the oldest campus group. Okay, so they had an university before, but it was very conservative. And some of the students in the 60s are going, "Wait, I want to." The Vietnam War happening. I'm raising all these, I'm thinking all these, the civil rights movement, I want to push the boundaries of religion, and we can't. So they went to a religious studies professor at then Eastern and said, let's do something about it, and that created UCM. 
And I have the flyers and folders and uh, programming from 1967 to today. And apparently college students like pizza. You know, <laughs> Dexo pizza, no, but regular pizza, yes. You know, they like getting fed, right? <laughs> uh, uh, baby boomers like getting fed in college. Gen Xers liked it. Millennials were quite fond of it. So, you know. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, uh, let's see. This is, no, uh, before we'll go back a little bit, uh, back to the food. Um, so we'll bring Jim's homemade cookies. Close to on campus, we do anyways. <laughs> they're just good, right? You know, uh, I think a couple of those are us taking over the basement at First English Lutheran and having a big Thanksgiving kind of end of the semester bash. Um, okay, now we'll go to the next slide. Um, we haven't done this forever. I don't think you guys, we had a karaoke night. Karaoke is amazing. Um, um, yeah, the, the, uh, um, the point is, you're trying to build thick relationships. Gen Z report that the biggest issue they felt around COVID was being socially isolated. And they felt it more than almost any group. So we're in an odd place that it should be our community life at, at campus is just exploding with activity. You know, for two years you go on campus and there's nobody in the studio. Now there's always somebody there, right? Uh, the, the anxious to get connected, which is really cool. Okay, now, I want to mention two things just to embarrass my two students. We'll go to the next slide. Yay, you guys got, okay, so I have to do this. So, so basically, I wanted to mention this, that we have these student leadership awards, and our two peer ministers got recognized um, uh, in categories of emergent student leader, student president, and social justice category. Um, because I like to think the campus itself is recognized in the, the way in which all these groups are trying to create some sort of community on the campus. And that matters. Because um, it is possible to go to MSUB and just take some classes online and never meet somebody. And this only makes sense because you know, you're a parent and working. Um, but if you can get a student experience where you actually meet people and build relationships, I mean, that's the stuff you remember from. The friends you made, <laughs> uh, the weird trips you did. <laughs> I was just uh, we were just talking about you know, just doing a car ride. You know, those are the kind of the things. And so that's that's the goal that we're trying to do on the campus. Um, and I mention this too because um, I think students are really primed for that at MSUB, but it it doesn't register because MSUB is not a campus that does protest, organizes political wants to hear another lecture by a philosophy professor like an adult, right? <laughs> they don't tend to, but it doesn't mean that MSUB is not community-minded or the students don't want to connect with one another, but just on a different basis than what you might see on some larger campuses. But it's a really fun, it's a really fun place to work. So that's a, uh, well, we'll see how remotely accurate the other gave of the campus life, but thank you all. You have a Q&A, I know that we're writing into I probably took more time. Yes? What's the retention, uh, graduation rate compared to other schools? So, we are, hang on, I think I want to say we're about 50%. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's a, uh, which is, you know, compared to our community colleges average around 20, so it's really significant. But Bozeman and Missoula tend to be in the 70% range. Yeah, I think they're actually it is? Yeah, I think they're around 60. Yeah, 50 60? Something. Yeah, they're pretty low. 60. Yeah. So MSUB is fairly comparable to like yeah. Bozeman and Yeah, it's fairly low. But, it, it, but here's the one thing is, it, so the student loan debt crisis is probably yeah. big, 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 yeah. Well, they got college degrees and they've got lots of money. Well, most Americans have been to college, but most Americans have not completed a, a bachelor's degree. So, but you still have that student loan debt. Um, and, but student retention is a huge part of that, uh, is just sticking to the school. And the one thing that was weird to me in MSUB, because when I was in Missoula, this was 30 years ago, but also our kind of the cohort of students that I hung out with, you know, college is something you just did in four years. It was just, I've run into students, I've worked with students like, oh, I'm here this semester, but I'm taking a break, and then I'm gonna work, and then I'm gonna come back. Sometimes they do, though not always. 
Um, or I took some classes in Bozeman or Billings, but now I'm transferring. I'm going to Bozeman now. So you kind of have to be used to students will come in your life, and they will leave. <laughs> you know, depending on their, yeah, yeah. I just had a quick question about your autistic students. Mm -hmm. um, are there particular reasons why they feel alienated from the rest of the campus? Oh, well, th this is a huge discussion on its own, but uh, I'll do the quick. So autism uh, can affect the way that one socially negotiates. Uh, it's a, it, it really focuses, the deficits that become apparent relate to s social skills. Um, um, it is not, as some folks have believed, uh, will believe, because I've seen autistic people are geniuses. Well, most, most of us are not, right? Or the other are, or it's a cognitive deficit. It's not. It's just a different neural brain. So, so um, I'll give you an example, and why I think this works really well here. Um, I had a student leader who was autistic, who was really into church history. Um, and he would do really, really big, deep dives into the subject. And then he would share it with all the world, <laughs> including folks who didn't ask whether they wanted <laughs> to know about the subject, right? <laughs> and um, he got pushed out of one of the other religious groups, because you know, they have an attractional model of ministry, you know? If he has smart, successful, good-looking, you know, students. Other students will want to kind of, and uh, um, it was, but he, he brought so much to the table. He became one of our peer ministers and was a previous student president. And he led some amazing faith-based conversations because he knew his stuff. So to me, you know, so uh, um, uh, that was a gift he had that wasn't being recognized socially. So you see, try to create a space where that's a plus to know a lot of stuff about that, right? Um, but autistic people don't always find communities where their passions or their interests are are received, <laughs> or the, the way they are socially related is received. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of the autism zone is just like, well, this is a place you don't have to be just like, well, I'd be accepted, <laughs> you know. Um, and be able to share, you know, who I am, you know, in that context. So, um, yeah, I think that's. I'm hoping that we're trying to do something with like kind of training for faculty and staff to just be like, here's some things that are useful for autistic students we need to know. So I think that would be my helpful. Service. Yeah, because one of the things um, I have some relatives visiting right now, and, and one of them is autistic. Yeah. The affect is very flat. Yeah, that could be. You know, it's just like. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, thank you very much. Exactly. <laughs> and well, I'll tell you the funny thing is, because I've been told that myself, and I'm like, I feel like I'm being very crazy dynamic right now, you know? And then, like, <laughs> no. But I'll tell you, I'll do a book plug. Okay, so basically, you know, I mentioned Michael McCurry, and he spoke at uh, uh, the campus. And he talks about his own experience. He's like 25, 26 year old comedian. But he talks about his childhood in particular. And um, um, they ordered it. On at this house of books. And they sold some at this thing, but they've got a stack at this house of books. So if you were to go over there to end your autograph by him. But he, there's so many childhood stories of him. How am I going to learn how to socially relate? And he's very cognitively aware that he's different from other kids and that he wants to connect in the ways that he does, and some that fall flat on their face, and some that work. You know, he did a play. That he wrote did most of the school. What was the play? Do you remember this? He did something to do with SpongeBob. SpongeBob. Yeah, he did a play with SpongeBob and then wrote most of his classes through it. And it worked, you know. <laughs> Which is yeah. Um, but it doesn't always work for autistic students. They keep on bumping into that social. And here you don't have to look at it. You see it is not based on the attractional model of ministry, it's based on the <laughs> uh, I don't know what the word is, but Love. Love, we just we want to hang out and be ourselves, you know? So it's kind of like for everybody else who doesn't fit that, that particular model. Um, and that feels, you know, I had a student, uh, actually it was Elizabeth, and like she just saw our table and probably all the rainbow flags and crayons. And she just kind of sat down on the grass while we we're tabling during some orientation. She said, well, this feels safe. Like, that's good, right? Yeah, this feels safe. <laughs> So that, that would be the goal, yeah.
But yeah, you, you might recognize some of the people on the screen just, you know, because they're here. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> First, do you ever perhaps partner with other student groups on campus? Yes. And of course, I'm very interested in this. There's a huge Native American yes. club there, and it's consistent throughout the years. But um, secondly, clubs really have a lot to do with student development. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they're like on resumes or even in a, um, a, a position to be a part of you know, how they go on to grad school, that information is essential. Yeah. So I'm like that. So I'm just curious about that. Yeah, well, that's huge. I mean, all the roles, I mean, um, the student groups are, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a chance to exercise leadership and develop skill sets and lead meetings and be the public spokesperson and um, strategize. And some of it is just, or, or even being aware this is a tough skill, but you guys are all having an annual meeting, right? So you, you, you're thinking about what's on the agenda, but you also, how is everybody receiving it? What are the group dynamics that are happening right now? Those kind of skill sets that you can develop. Um, it won't be a shock to say we've, got, uh, we, we, we've not been able to connect with the other religious groups on campus. They, they, they might uh, think of us as uh, heretics. So, but, but there are other groups, right? So we, we did LGBT and the Native American Achievement Center did a trivia night. We did a Jeopardy style, right after Alex Trebek passed away. And we even had the buzzers, you know? And it was like, we're, and each one was either LGBT history or Montana Native tribal history. And we did it together. Um, we've done some women and gender studies. We did a lot of stuff with some of the international students. Um, um, and, uh, now there's a Center for New York University, which is not a college group, but it, they helped us when we were trying to put together the Michael McCurry thing. So we are really uh, heroes, which does tremendous kind of peer mentorship and mental health kind of programming. So uh, we're always up for, and it always works well when groups come together to want to accomplish, you know, accomplish things. I was just curious, um, so, is it that UCM is considered the heretics? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Because <laughs> I find, find myself, you know, I, I mean, your your events are published, and sometimes I think I'm going to get down to them, and I've actually done that once or twice, you know. But um, the other, so what other religious groups are there on campus? Uh, crew and university. So crew is short for if you remember this group, Campus Crusade for Christ. Yeah, <laughs> so no, yeah. So, um, which is a shame on the one hand, but but you know we have students who actually do dip on several groups. So again, MSUB and each Montana students, the leadership may think this, but those boundaries and culture wars and all that, students don't tend to obey. They just kind of hang out with who they want to hang out with. So. Um, and there's a, there's a small p pragmatism of Eastern Montana students uh, that is wonderful to see as it unfolds at MSUB life. So, yeah, I mean, so I've certainly done, uh, connected with students in InterVarsity and crew, but in terms of groups formalized, it's going to be the Native American Achievement Center, it's going to be Women and Gender Studies, you know. We just did a thing with the uh, intern, it was Trans Day of Visibility, and there was an intern at the Women and Gender Studies and they came and presented on trans content makers, you know? So it's great whenever you can build that, so. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'd like to do is how do you build it with other campuses? But we've done a couple things with Rocky, but our schedules are just never aligned, you know? Mm -hmm. But, yes. Well, I think we're getting to the point where we need to be moving on. Yes, sir. May, may, may yes. I suggest that you introduce our two MIT I students? Should, I should. Uh, okay, so I will introduce uh, Luke, who is our student uh, president, and uh, so uh, and peer minister. So. Yay! <laughs> and you may have met him um, when he was younger. I think when you were in high school. Yes, yeah, 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 so, so and um, Mackenzie is a uh, uh, our student treasurer and peer minister. You're a treasurer for like three groups now. 
This is where the money she's got. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, and uh, leadership was out as well. Because um, out is supported by UC, but it is its own student organization. And I will just say, I've never had as hard work in government since with these students. So thank you so much uh, for all you do. And they're for anything, which is great. So, I mean, that's, that's the key to, if any advice for the EU fellowship, is like, you can develop ideas for the future and they can fall flat on their face, but if you're doing it together, it's, it's awesome. You know, if you're just up for it, give it a try and see the world and see what happens. So I think that's been our ethos. So thank you so much. <laughs> Touch 